Uh, my name is Lisa Stephen Friday. Um, I am an actor, musician, wannabe dancer uh, in the DC area. And um, I am the, the author, composer, and star of uh, Trans Am. So Trans Am is the autobiographical musical of my life. Um, you know, it centers around, a big portion of the show centers around my transition and the, the years of, of my life from my, from my late 20s to, you know, early 40s. Um, and a lot of it is centered around the, the, the rock and roll era of my life, which was with my band Lisa Jackson and Girl Friday. And that's where all of the music is pulled from for this show. And, uh, but the show starts, you know, when I'm literally six years old. Um, and they, we, we use the whole first number to set up all the scenario and, you know, snippets of what happened to the point of when I moved to New York City when I was 20 years old, which then sets the stage for this journey to self-actualization and acceptance um, through, through trial and error, love and loss, and um, a lot of really great rock and roll songs. Well, I, I say rock and roll. When people ask me, what is your, you know, what, what was Lisa Jackson and Girl Friday? You know, I think that my influences range from Van Halen to Tom Petty to Cyndi Lauper, uh, Prince, Deborah Harry. And, and those all kind of hit into certain categories of music. The height of glam rock was 1973. So I was not even one at that point. <laughs> That's the year I was born. Um, which sometimes makes me feel connected to like somehow like a love child of David Bowie. But, um, you know, glam rock is that era of Bowie, T-Rex, um, and a lot, mostly like British influenced bands. And then you get into punk rock, you know, you have, you have The Clash, The Ramones, but then you have bands, I think, that bridge the gap, which would be something like Blondie. Um, and that's probably more where we really fall. So I think there's a sprinkle of glam, a sprinkle of punk, but really we're a rock and roll band. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so in, in DC, you know, so we have the full fledged script, right? And we think it's pretty flushed out and it works very well. Um, but that show was, the music was solely me. I'm playing guitar, I'm singing. There's no pit band, there's, there's no one else on stage. And um, it works really well in this very storytelling kind of way. So when we come to the hangar, um, what we are now going to do is expand the show into having a band. And now it, in this particular production, the band will be on stage. You know, we still don't know yet. Maybe they'll be behind a scrim, whatever, but it's, you know, minimalistic. The band is not necessarily part of the scenes or the story, but they are definitely present and help to elevate the music. And we're going to use, develop arrangements that will kind of evolve as the story evolves, right? So the first song, who knows, may just, you'll just start hearing some piano. And by the second song, there's some drums. And then, you know, eventually, by the end of the show, we have a person who's, you know, me, who's come to some self-realizations and evolved and also music that has now evolved into a full-fledged rock and roll show. Um, you know, it was kind of during the height of the pandemic. And, and the whole reason I got involved with the, Keeg with the Keegan is that they were gonna do a production of Hedwig which they'd cast me as Hedwig. That got shelved because of the pandemic. As the first summer of the pandemic was happening, I had just reached out to 
to the folks at the Keegan and I said, would you be interested in doing a virtual show for Pride Month to raise some money for um, black led LGBTQ groups in DC? And they were like, yeah, that'll be great. And so what I did is that I just did this show where it was like singer songwriter and telling stories about the songs. Um, and it went over really well. And that kind of led to the Keegan then deciding they wanted to do a fall rep with two shows. And they asked me if I would take that performance that I did, elaborate on it into a one woman show. Um, and so all of the stories that I told became the framework of Trans Am. Um, I'm Deb Janke. I am the director of Within Elsewhere and also the artistic director of Live and in Color, who is partnering with The Hanger. And I have a long history with The Hanger, having done probably like five shows up there over the past 15 years. So I'm really excited to be back and collaborating and working with all of you again. <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Joshua Betancourt. Um, I am the conceiver and book writer for Within Elsewhere. Uh, this is my first time uh, going up to the hangar and I'm super excited to be partnering with everyone there and um, getting Within Elsewhere up on its feet. Uh, I'm Trent. Uh, I wrote the uh, music and lyrics for Within Elsewhere. Also my first time at the hangar. Um, Josh and I though, we grew up in Rochester, so not too far away, not super close, but not too far away. Completely, there is an app called Within Elsewhere that the characters can use to visit their dead relatives. So Within Elsewhere is um, truly a story of processing like grief. I think it's a cathartic experience, but it's also kind of, um, I think when you boil it down to like a moral, I think it's kind of a, the grass is always greener kind of story. Um, so I think audiences should expect to come and see something that is really deeply personal, um, but also a lot of fun. Um, and as we dive into this family, the Reyes family, and they lose one of their um, youngest siblings, we kind of see them, how they go through that grieving process. Um, just for some context, my grandfather uh, was diagnosed with throat cancer and um, he survived it um, and then was about like 10 to 12 years of um, cancer free and unfortunately went to like a follow up appointment and the cancer had spread to his entire body and uh, he unfortunately, you know, passed away uh, from that. And it was more of exploring about the journey of grieving and how that affects the person individually and sort of how that affected my family um, in, in that respect. But one interesting element of like when I was conceiving like the Elsewhere app um, and that world was um, a conversation I had with my mother. And uh, um, when she told me that she would call my, my grandfather's cell phone every single day and, and listen to his voicemail just to hear his voice. Um, and like everything else in my life, I take every uh, situation that happens and I sort of um, turn it into a story. I asked her one day, I was like, you know, what happens if, if he did pick up and how, how would that change things for you? What would you say to him? You know, like, and had like a three hour conversation about that. And that sort of like sparked this, um, this world and idea of, you know, what elsewhere is and, and that opportunity that presents for our characters. Yeah, the music is, um, I mean, we definitely live in a pop rock kind of land for this for this score, especially because the core characters are quite young. They're all in their 20s, um, whether it be their early or uh, even younger than their 20s, the youngest brother. Um, uh, so I wanted to keep things kind of modern, but there's, I wanted to do several things. I wanted to have um, a lot of like uh, heartfelt moments that I think can be achieved through these like really crunchy chords that kind of appear in contemporary music. But I also was like, gosh, we can't just like have this giant cathartic piece. No one's going to want to just sit through like heartache after heartache. We have to have some fun. So when we do have the opportunity to have fun, we have these really bright, like um, one of the songs is even a disco 
So, you know what I mean? We, we pump it up when, when we need to. And I think the balance of those two sounds is kind of where the show lives. Um, there's a huge portion of the parents in the show that have a lot of Latin music. And um, that all came from Josh's mom. So this all kind of came out of Josh's like family. And she sent me all of these songs. A lot of Selena was in there. <laughs> um, and she sent me all these like her favorite playlist. And so when we get to like the parents music, all of that is like inspired by and a culmination of these, um, this music that she's just sent me. So, um, and, and since I'm writing the lyrics and there's some Spanish and stuff in the show, all of that is through Josh's mom. We sent all the lyrics to her. I talked through everything with Josh. I'm like, does this make sense? Um, you know what I mean? Josh gives things to me and then I lyricize them later. So we're, we really work closely together because I am not Latin. So I think it's, uh, I need <laughs> those voices on the music in, in that regard. Right before the pandemic, um, I was introduced to Trent and Josh through our good friend Julianne Merrill, who's an amazing musical director, and uh, she was uh, working with um, the, the International Musical Theater School. I forget the full name. I I know it's I -T -M -T. I -T, What those letters stand yeah. for? I don't. Know. <laughs> anyway, anyway, they were uh, doing a new series where they were workshopping like twenty minutes of a new show, and. Um, through my company, Live and in Color, which is eight years old now, we develop new plays and musicals that promote and celebrate diverse artists. Julianne brought me in and I immediately fell in love with Trent and Josh's work. Um, and this particular piece, which wasn't written yet even, really. <laughs> um, um, but I think what uh, sparked my interest was um, the, how the idea of grief and technology come together. So what's interesting to me about it is how we use technology to deal with whatever issues we are going through in our life and how that can be either beneficial or problematic. Um, mm -hmm. So that was really exciting to me. I immediately fell in love with their music and how they tell stories. Also the fact that it was um, a eight person musical for all BIPOC actors. Um, and speaking of a Latin family where the focus isn't being Latin, but it's sort of the background of, of, of the, just how we live in America, the world we live in. Um, so that was what appealed to me. So it felt very modern that way. Um, um, uh, my passion is new work and, and I think it's really exciting for audiences and communities to experience how a musical is made because it's a long haul and it's a lot of work <laughs> and a lot of time to, to get a musical to production. Um, and so part of my mission in uh, helping emerging artists is trying to create a pipeline for them to succeed. And I'm so grateful that The Hanger and you are partnering with us to be part of that pipeline. Um, Cause I do believe these two young gentlemen are, are the future of American musical theater, so. Yeah. <laughs>